。我现在是在郑州富士康厂区周围的宿舍区域。之前很多人在网上就说富士康已经搬走了，现在港区是一座空城。那实际究竟是不是这样呢？我们今天就来实地看一看富士康厂区周边现在是什么样的一个状况。我现在是在裕康新城。这附近呢，之前是特别火热的一个地方，因为很多富士康的员工就住在周围。下面呢就是商业街，不过我们现在可以看一下，这下面的商业街啊，和网上拍的一样，确实已经全部关门了。之前我还不相信呢，没想到现在真的是这样，所有的店全部都关了，啊，几乎是所有的店没有再开着门营业的。The global industrial chain shift has resulted in foreign enterprises in China transferring their production lines to Southeast Asia and India. This move has led to a significant drop in purchase orders for raw materials and components from Chinese local enterprises. This change has profound implications for China's economy. The relocation of foreign businesses has caused widespread job losses and significant income reductions for those who remain employed. These factors have all led to a contraction in China's domestic market, further impacting China's economy and posing significant challenges to social stability. Foxconn, a world-leading electronics manufacturer, has recently announced its production line shift in China during a media interview. Liu Yangqing, the company's chairman, revealed in a BBC interview that Foxconn had moved part of its production line to Mexico and Vietnam. Which undoubtedly exacerbates the economic impact of the industrial chain shift. From a higher perspective, Foxconn's action might indicate a broader shift of its production line out of China. Foxconn plans to invest $500 million in setting up a manufacturing plant in the southern Indian state of Telangana, a move indicating that the major Apple supplier is steadily expanding its base in the South Asian market. Foxconn already manufactures iPhones in India, and earlier this year won a bid to manufacture AirPods in the country. According to local media reports, Foxconn bought land in Bengaluru worth $37 million in May. Foxconn also received approval from the Karnataka government at the end of March to invest $968 million in the state. Foxconn's move is representative of many foreign-funded companies withdrawing from China. Experts say that the trend of de-Chinaizing the production supply chain has become mainstream. It's not easy for China to increase its exports. Furthermore, as foreign capital continues to withdraw from mainland China, it is advisable for companies in China to escape if possible. It's the best strategy. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, was present for the opening of Apple stores in India, where he also met with Indian Prime Minister Modi. Cook stated that India is at a turning point and that the vibrancy of its market is unbelievable. Apple has declared India, Brazil, and Mexico as its future key markets, notably leaving China out of the conversation. Amid Cook's praises for India, media reports revealed that the workforce of Foxconn in Zhengzhou, once numbering 300,000, has been reduced to 60 to 70,000. The area surrounding the Zhengzhou Foxconn plant is becoming a ghost town, with once bustling commercial streets now deserted and most shops closed. Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasizes promoting growth and suggests that focus should shift from exports to domestic demand. Meanwhile, Li Qiang, the premier of the state council, recently directed efforts to increase trade by all possible means. However, domestic demand in China has significantly decreased due to many political factors. Given Xi Jinping's ambitious foreign policies and wolf warrior diplomacy, increasing exports is a difficult task. As Xi monopolizes power, he may not only misdiagnose China's economic problems, but also have fewer fiscal means at his disposal. Today's China, whether in the industry, commerce, or the service sectors, faces an unprecedented predicament. This pressure is evident in the real estate market, with industrial buildings increasingly vacant. In Suzhou, numerous enterprises have relocated. Leaving behind an increasing number of empty factories with no takers, 
In Shenzhen, upscale office buildings are deserted, and roadside restaurants and various shops are up for transfer. 今天去朋友的公司参观学习，发现深圳市区的经济真的是下滑的太厉害了。之前看到高档的写字楼里空空荡荡的，经济特别不景气。可没想到现在严重的程度已经超过我的预期，连商场，包括路边的，包括路边的餐饮都开始转让了。Without foreign orders, China struggles to provide for its own citizens. June, a traditionally robust sales period, saw China facing an unprecedented sales slump. Small and medium-sized enterprises finds it challenging to cope with rising production costs and declining orders. Many business owners are breaking down under the mental strain, with some even opting to close their companies. A large number of orders are being diverted to places like Vietnam and India. And the once thriving factories are gradually becoming relics of the past. 以美帝为首的西方列强，由于忍受不了娼妓辱骂，现在开始把他们手上的订单向印度、越南这种地方转移了，害得我们这种实体加工厂冲骗冲骗的倒闭。Social media bloggers believe the wave of small factory closures will peak in the second half of the year. Profits for these small factories have dwindled. With those making a profit of more than 20%, few and far between, they are sustained by loans with double-digit annual interest rates, and many default on their loan repayments when they come due. For many people, even though they earn over 10,000 yuan a month, they need to pay 6,000 yuan for their mortgage and 3,000 yuan for their car loan, leaving them with barely enough for everyday expenses. Living in these conditions becomes extremely difficult. White-collar workers aged 35 and above are forced to become food delivery drivers or offer designated driving services. Unable to find work or experiencing decreased income in the city, many rural laborers choose to return to the countryside, only to find work there elusive as well. Many people say, "You guys are not working. You come to us to find work." 做药的、医药行业的公司转包出去了，结果不需要业务员了，他就给下岗失业了，失业了，找不着工作，去跑外卖了。哎呀，做路边人可失落。Wage expectations continue to decline from 8,000 yuan to 7,000 yuan, then down to 6,000. However, the reality is that even jobs offering 5,000 yuan are being snapped up. Many people who came to the cities from small towns and rural areas to find work have chosen to return home half a year early in June. Meanwhile, daily wages have dipped to a mere 13 to 20 yuan per hour, far below the minimum wage of 23 yuan. Jobs are becoming increasingly scarce, while the number of job seekers continues to rise. On the streets of Guangzhou. Throngs of people gather as early as 7:50 each morning in the hope of finding temporary work. China's economic hardship isn't limited to the industrial sector; commerce is also severely affected. Following the end of the 6:18 shopping festival, many online stores face closure. While the festival brought record-breaking sales for top sellers, most businesses fared poorly and faced the risk of going under. In the heart of Shanghai, food delivery workers idle about due to a sharp drop in orders. Across the nation, all industries are generally struggling, and wage levels have significantly dropped. A cost consulting firm was recruiting interns for installation budgeting, requiring construction-related graduates with good academic performance. Yet the remuneration was merely a provided lunch and a monthly salary of 300 yuan. A third-tier hospital cut a clinical doctor's salary by 8,000 yuan per month, and administrative staff salaries by 3,000 yuan. Those running labor intermediaries, who used to make easy money recruiting hundreds of people a day, are now closing shop and heading home. In China's major cities, the strain on factories and commercial activities is only the tip of the iceberg, with the service industry also struggling. 
For instance, the once bustling Chengdu Airport is now eerily vacant. This is Changshu's commercial street. Can you find a place more desolate? Starbucks outlets in big cities, which used to be packed with people of all sorts, clutching their laptops and occupying seats for the whole day, are no longer the bustling hubs they used to be. Those in the food service industry are anxious, resorting to offering discounts on Chinese TikTok, Douyin, or shopping platform Meituan. Bathhouses share the same anxiety due to the lack of customers and orders. This predicament has even spread to China's three major telecommunications operators, who have begun resorting to disguised wage cuts, such as eliminating vehicle and communication subsidies, affecting nearly one million employees. By the end of 2022, China Mobile, China Unicom, and China Telecom had 450,000, 240,000, and 280,000 employees, respectively, with some even complaining of halved incomes. 今天，在中国雇佣一百人以上的民营企业老板都是焦虑无比的，雇佣一千人以上的老板都是生不如死的，雇佣一万人以上的老板都是直接消失的。普通员工嘛，要么担心被毕业，要么已经被毕业。现在老板很焦虑，普通老板呢，要么是在计划着什么时候破产，要么是想跟别人卷，都卷不起来，因为没订单。现在呢，优秀员工很焦虑。为什么呢？因为业绩完成不了，压力很大，担心被毕业。现在牛逼的老板也很焦虑，啊，业务是有的，但是呢，卷得太狠，最终没利润。In China today, private enterprise owners employing more than 100 people are extremely anxious. Those employing more than a thousand people feel as though they're barely surviving, and those employing over 10,000 are practically vanishing. Ordinary employees fear layoffs. Top performers are anxious about meeting performance goals. Ordinary bosses plan for bankruptcy due to lack of orders, and even the successful bosses are stressed as fierce competition leaves little room for profit. A Chinese blogger summarized that foreign capital is withdrawing from factories, leading to shutdowns and halting production. Causing public income to decrease and making it difficult to maintain past levels of consumption. The sheen of modernity barely conceals the creeping return of poverty that existed a century ago. China's refusal to abide by international rules has led to a gradual exodus of the global supply chain from China. This exodus, intensified by the escalating China-U.S. standoff and the continuous upgrade of Western technology. Is hitting in waves. It's worth mentioning the state of China's electric vehicle industry, one of the country's five major emerging industries. The decline is staggering. In the European market, Chinese electric vehicles only account for two percent of the market share, and they face fierce competition from Tesla in their domestic market. More crucially, some Chinese new energy vehicle companies are suspected of inflating their sales figures. According to publicly available sales data, BYD has the highest sales, followed by Tesla. However, a detailed analysis of the data from various car companies reveals a widening gap between the official sales numbers of Chinese domestic brands and the number of insured vehicles. Sixty percent of officially sold vehicles have not been put on the road; they are largely used as collateral for bank loans. Where have these 60% of vehicles gone? It turns out that they have become collateral in the hands of banks. New energy vehicle companies sell their vehicles to car dealers, who then use these vehicles as collateral at the bank, borrowing money that they return to the car companies. According to bank data, the financial penetration rate of new energy vehicles has reached 64%. Meaning that 64% of vehicles produced by the manufacturer have been pledged to financial institutions. Consequently, these pledged cars have not been put on the road, but rather parked in large parking lots or unfinished buildings covered with layers of dust. If people don't have money and car sales are poor, car dealers have no way to repay the borrowed money, so these loaned cars must be legally auctioned. 
At the same time, there will be a negative impact on the stock prices of auto companies, thereby weakening their financial capabilities. Hence, these car companies resort to falsifying sales numbers. In addition, some Chinese new energy vehicle companies have invested heavily in battery technology, electric vehicle software, and charging infrastructure. But the selling price of each car is not high, causing a loss with each sale. As a result, many companies now cannot even afford to pay their own payables. For example, Chinese automobile manufacturer NIO has over 10 billion yuan in cash, but it faces over 40 billion yuan in debts due in the next six months, resulting in a funding gap of over 20 billion yuan. Similarly, the Huawei backed electric vehicle brand Weltmeister sold 75,000 vehicles last year. But this year's monthly sales have dropped to 3 to 4,000, with its stock price also dropping by 62%. Raising funds on the market is increasingly difficult. Overall, these companies all face the risk of a broken capital chain. On the other hand, many overseas traditional fuel car companies are also actively transitioning to new energy vehicles. These century old enterprises have stable returns in the capital market. And possess rich experience in the automobile industry. Even if they cannot immediately launch electric vehicles, if they can collaborate with companies like Foxconn, they stand a good chance of seizing the market opportunity window for new energy vehicles. With the Chinese new energy vehicle companies facing capital chain ruptures, these traditional car manufacturers may occupy a portion of the China market, creating a real crisis for China's new energy vehicle upstarts. Moreover, current electric cars are seen as transition products. With technological advancement, there may be significant changes in the future. For instance, if foreign companies make breakthroughs in solid state battery technology or autonomous driving software, cars produced by Chinese new energy vehicle companies may be unsellable on the market, or even not fetch enough funds when pledged to banks. Simultaneously, vehicles previously pledged to banks may not get good prices in the auction process, potentially causing substantial losses for Chinese financial institutions. The Chinese government has long relied on policies and governmental force to drive transformation, but it has overlooked one reality. In the current environment where foreign capital is continuously withdrawing, China's economy is declining, and the pressure on people's lives is increasing. The support for the electric vehicle market is gradually weakening. China's woke warrior diplomacy and infringements on intellectual property rights are leading to doubts among foreign companies and investors about China. This has resulted in Chinese new energy vehicle companies facing challenges in technology and funding. Global technology and human civilization, especially industrial civilization, are largely built on Western foundations. Intellectual property rights, as the crystallization of human wisdom, should be respected and protected to maintain fair competition. If China continues to steal Western technology, then Western companies and investors will not be willing to share their latest technologies, nor will they invest in Chinese new energy vehicle companies' shares. Over the past 40 plus years, the world has been tolerating China, but China's theft of technology. The desire for cheap shortcuts and an overbearing attitude are gradually leading to the global shift of supply chains. This could potentially push the Chinese people back to the poverty they experienced a hundred years ago. Under these circumstances, some are starting to question whether it's time to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party, allowing the Chinese people to return to the mainstream of human civilization. Yin, yin, yin.